God is so good. God is so good. You know, he, he wants to speak to us. He does speak to us. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we have a purpose. That we're not just here just because. We have a purpose. God is speaking to us. He, he's got a purpose for us as a church, as a group of people, to press forward and press on and press in. He's promised us and spoken to us that he's going to move so powerfully by his spirit that he's bringing a move of the spirit that's going to be bigger than what we can imagine or ask or think. And uh, we've been asking big and thinking big, so God is about to do something amazing. I believe we're on the, the edge of it, the precipice of it. I believe that this next new year is going to be outstanding as long as we stay focused on him, as long as, long as we look at him and what he is doing. Because it is so easy to look at circumstances and what is happening through the, you know, the media will tell a story and, you know, things can happen and we can look at the natural and not see what God is doing. We have got to be people of the spirit, people who hear God and who understand what God is doing, be people of the times. Are you hearing me today? Somebody said to me today, she said, uh, if uh, this message is half as good as last week, then it's going to be good. Well, I immediately thought, well, what if it's only a third as good? Isn't it easy how we go to the negatives in our thinking? It's so easy. But God speaks to us. He speaks to the humble and the hungry. And we've got to make sure that we keep our hearts right. That, that he speaks to the humble. He speaks to those who hunger after him. If we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. But if we, if we just think we know everything, then God won't speak to us. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble, James 4, 6. He resists pride. If we think we know everything, we get puffed up. Knowledge puffs up. So we've got to remain with a right heart towards God, remain humble. He speaks to the humble and the hungry. And so we've got to make sure that we, we keep our heart right towards God and keep our hunger in the right place. That we're hungry for what God does. God is so concerned about motives. He's concerned about the, de the desire of our heart, what is it for? We want to press into God. We want to walk into the fullness of what God has for us. But it, we've got to know what our purpose is and know that God will speak and he will lead and be people of the Spirit. They that are led by the Spirit shall be called the sons of God, it says in Romans. And we've got to be led by his Spirit, not thinking that we know it all, not thinking we have all the answers. He's the one. God has all the answers. God knows what he's doing. And it's been about walking with him but we have to play our part as his people, as his body. He's the head, he's the one that gives the directions, calls the shots. So sometimes we can think we've got it all figured out and we know what to do and we just do our thing. But there's no results when we just do things naturally. There's a huge difference between walking in the spirit and walking in the flesh. And sometimes when we think we know what's going on, when we think we know what God's doing and we just do it ourselves, we can end up very easily doing it out of the flesh and not out of the life flow of the Spirit. When God does it, it's easy. But when we do it, it can be hard work. And it's about a relationship in walking with God and walking. I really believe that God is just re-emphasizing this. In my experience, the closer we get to God, the more we've got to get our motive in order and holiness is so important. Holiness is not just about not doing the bad things. It's about dealing with the things that don't work with God. We've heard it said already a couple of times this morning. We've got to watch the, the, the negative thoughts, the, the, the things that get around about our thinking and take us off track, the discouragements, the disappointments. They won't take you into the promises of God. And so we've got to be careful to make sure that we bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Is this making sense this morning? We've got to understand how this spirit world works. God is a spirit. And they that worship him, worship him in spirit and in truth. And I trust that this morning you've connected with God as we worship him. Not just about singing a song. If you come and just sing a song, you've missed the point. Is that true? It's about connecting with God out of our spirit. Connecting with the, the one who holds all things by the word of his power. God is, is in the heavens. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 that God created the heavens and the earth and he put us on the earth. If you're not here on earth, 
You're not here. He's put us on the earth. And until just very recently, when man learnt to fly and overcome the laws of physics, you couldn't get very far from the earth. You jump a little bit. Even if you go to the highest mountain, you're still on the earth. Is that right? We are here on earth. So, if I can describe it like this, there are three heavens, if I can use that term. Stay with me. The Bible says in, Rome, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2 to 4, Paul speaking, I saw a man who was caught up into the third heaven. So if there was a third heaven, there's got to be a one and a two. Does that make sense? He said, I saw a man who in 14 years ago, whether in the body, I don't know, whether out of the body, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. God is in the third heaven. He's in that place where he kicked the devil out. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And he was kicked out. Get out. Because of the pride that was found in him, kicked the devil out. There is no devil in heaven, in the third heaven. There are no devils there. It's the place where God has his throne, seated on the third heaven. It's the place that we enter into in worship. We come into his presence, into the throne room of God, where God rules and has all power and authority in that third heaven. We down here on earth are in the first heaven, this first spiritual realm. So what is the second one? Let's have a look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, there's no devil in the third heaven with God. But in that second heaven, we have principalities, powers, the rulers of darkness of this age. In that second heaven. Is this making sense? You with me? So we have God in the third heaven, we're here in the first heaven, and we have the principalities and powers, the rulers of darkness of this age. They're not with God, they're rulers of darkness. God is the light. The rulers of darkness are in the second heavens. Take up the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. And it goes on talking about the armour of God. But we, friends, we are called to walk with God and to rule from the third heaven. He is the head, Christ is the head, we are his body on the earth. We are to represent Christ on the earth. You hear? So we've got to understand how this spiritual world works to be able to walk in the authority that he's given us. The second heaven is a place of, how can I say this? It's a place where the devil works by legalities. Revelation 12 says he is the accuser of the brethren. He's looking for some legal reason to accuse you. And he works by legality. He'll come where he's allowed. He'll go where he's allowed. He'll try to usurp his authority. And back at the beginning in Genesis chapter 1, we have Adam and Eve. Adam was deceived. Sorry, Eve was deceived. And Adam said, I'm going with the wife. <laughs> I'm going with her. And they fell. Adam and Eve. The Bible says it's all Adam's fault because we're all born in Adam. Are you here? And in that place, the devil took dominion on the earth in this first heaven. Jesus came, born as the, as the Lamb of God without sin to take away the sins of the world. And as we invite him in, and he is in us, and we are in him, and he is the head, and we are the body, and we are part of him, and we are partakers of his divine nature, and our sin is dealt with, then Christ empowers us. When Christ returned and spoke as a risen Christ, he says, all authority in heaven 
and earth, that's first, second, and third heaven, has been given to me, therefore you go. So we have authority because he took that authority back from the devil. He took it. He won it back. We've got the authority. Are you hearing this? So we've got to walk in this thing. But we cannot deal with second heaven problems from the first heaven. Let me say that again. We cannot deal with second heaven problems from the first heaven. Some problems are because of this spiritual realm impacting on people. Here's a way to tell. You can tell it's a spiritual problem when really, really smart people believe really, really stupid things. You know it's a spirit involved here because it doesn't make sense. A spirit blinds people, it says. Blinds, read the book of Ephesians, it's so full of these truths. It blinds people to the truth. But God has come so that we may see the truth and have our eyes open to truth. So when really, really smart people believe really, really stupid things, there's a spirit thing going on here. And we cannot defeat the realm of the second heaven, the spirit, the, the rulers of wickedness. We cannot defeat them with just a, a first heaven response, just a natural response. We've got to get the answers from God. We've got to go into the third heaven and get the answers from God to deal with the second heaven. You, I'm, I'm trying to explain this really, you know, so that we can walk in this thing. But God has given us authority. So sometimes we just come and think we've got authority, but we haven't got the answer from God. It's why it's so important that we people, be people of the Spirit that are able to hear the voice of the Spirit, that are able to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, so we can deal with the problems in the second heaven and deal with them spiritually rather than just reactively. One of the examples that I can give is one of the, the things that's happening that we see today around the world is the devil is attacking origins. He attacks the origins of creation. And so we don't value the creation. He's attacking the origins of family. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. God made man and woman, male and female, he created them. He created, let me say that again, male and female. Really, really smart people start believing really, really stupid things when this spirit gets involved and tries to remove those foundation truths. That we were created male and female. And it cannot change unless you're a fish or a crab or something weird. <laughs> you look at everything in creation is male or female. Everything. I look at it, you get male trees, female trees. You get male cows, female cows. I have never, ever seen a cow questioning its gender. There's no question mark. Men can step in and, you know, the bull a bull. The spirit of this thing is getting at the origins trying to convince people that the origin of life, when somebody has a baby, oh, that's not a person. And women believe that they can, they can, it's not a person, so it doesn't matter to abort this thing. And we have this spirit influencing our world. Is this making sense today? We cannot deal with second heaven problems from the first heaven. We've got to get the strategies and answers of heaven to deal with this. This, this is where I'm going with this. The, the, the authority of heaven to, to deal with these spiritual powers. We've got to get the answers from God. It's why it's so important that we peep of the Spirit. The trials of the righteous are many, but the Lord delivers us from, the, from them all. Why are there many, many trials for the righteous? One of the things that God wants us to do is to press into Him. It's all about relationship. 
The second heaven is about legality and authority and who's got the most power. But in the third heaven, it's not about power. We've already been given power. It's about relationship. It's about getting to know him and walking with him, walking and knowing him, knowing him, knowing the fellowship of his sufferings. And I've found in my walk with God, as we step more and more into holiness, that that place of holiness, it's not just about doing the wrong and right thing. It's about having a holy heart, about having motives right. It's about dealing with every ungodly thing in our thoughts, every unforgiveness, every scrap of bitterness, every negative, every everything. To be able to walk with God, we've got to cleanse our, our minds from being double-minded. We've got to cleanse and, and to be able to walk with him, to walk in relationship with a holy God, so that we can't take negative thoughts into that holy place. We can't take unforgivenesses into that holy place. You can't take manipulation into that holy place. You can't take those things into the holy place and to, for, the, for the answers of God to flow around about you. And as I look at the great, wonderful people of God, they talk about being clothed with God, clothed with his presence, clothed with his goodness. And that takes some taken up your cross and dealing with selfish ambition, dealing with selfish motive, dealing with uh, unforgivenesses and bitternesses and hurts and the things that aren't allowed in the presence of God. It takes dying to our selfishness. So I'm quiet here today. See, see if, if we're going to win in the spirit, we've got to walk with God in the third heaven and hear the answers of heaven and allow God to flow through us in the first heaven, for the answers of the third heaven to defeat the second heaven and outwork on the first heaven. <laughs> we need third heaven answers. Last week I spoke about Elijah, who had come to deal with the prophets of Baal. And... Uh, His time was up, and he went to pass on his purpose, his mantle, onto his servant. His servant's name was Elisha. So they're very similar names, Elisha and Elijah. So he said to Elisha, if you see me when I go, you can have my mantle. Elisha said, I want a double portion. Does anybody want a double portion? A lot of people laugh. Nobody put up their hand. <laughs> he said, I want a double portion. He said, if you see me when I go, if you see me, I'm going up to heaven. Elijah, they, were, they went for a walk down to the next village. Elijah said, you stay here. And Elijah said, no, no, I'm not leaving. I'm sticking with you. All right, come along. Went down to the next village. Elijah said to Elisha, you stay here. Elijah said, I am not leaving you. I'm staying with you. I want to see you when this thing goes, when you go up. I'm waiting to see you go up. They went to the next village. Elijah said, you stay here. Elijah said, no, I am staying with you. And then from heaven, there was, you can read this in 2 Kings, there was a chariot of fire and a chariot with fiery horses and Elijah went up in a whirlwind. Now, I just told you that story. How did Elijah go up? But what did he see? He saw the chariots of fire and the chariots of fiery horses. And it would be so easy to be distracted by this amazing thing and not see Elijah go up in the whirlwind. He didn't go up in the chariots. He went up in the whirlwind. It's so easy for all these amazing spiritual things to happen and we can still miss what God is doing. We've got to have discernment. One of the things I'm asking God for, because sometimes I think mine's a little short. God, I want to discern what you're doing. I want to hear your voice. I want to know what you're doing to be able to walk with you. God, I'm hungry for this move of God, but I don't want to just be on the sidelines watching. With all these manifestations and things happen and miracles and stuff, I don't want to be on the sidelines not knowing what you're doing and just enjoying the outworking. 
I want to know what you're doing, God. I want, I want to hear your heart. I want to, I want to walk with you in this. Are you hearing this? So we can, be, we, can, we can see the manifestation or we can see what God is doing. Elisha went on and you look at the works that he did. He had twice as many things occur in his life that Elijah did. So he had a double portion of the mantle. He did twice as much. Elisha had a servant called Gehazi. Gehazi. I don't know how you say it. Gehazi. How do you say it? Gehazi. I haven't heard that one. Okay. We're going to say it like Ray says it. It's Gehazi. Gehazi. And he was supposed to take on the mantle. He was supposed to be passed on. And there's a whole story in 2 Corinthians, I think it's chapter 6, where uh, Elisha went to a Syrian who had leprosy. Now, Syria and Israel were at, were at odds. They were at conflict. And God was trying to do an amazing number here and resolve this conflict with the nations. So this captain in Syria had leprosy and he heard that there was a prophet in Israel who could bring miracles. And so he went to Elisha and Elisha said, go dip in the river Jordan. The Syrian got a bit upset about that. Why should I go to the miserable Jordan? We've got better rivers than that. And the servant said to him, well, that's what the prophet said to do. You can either be obedient or not. He eventually was obedient. He went down and he dipped in the river and he came out whole, healed of his leprosy. And he said, what can I do for the prophet? I'll send him some money. I'll pay him something. So he went to the servant, Gehazi, and said, I'll give you, a, I'll pay you for this. And Gehazi, Gehazi, rubbed his hands together. Thank you very much. I'll take this money. Comes back to the prophet. The prophet says, what were you doing? Where were you? And he tried to cover it up. The thing with God is you cannot cover up stuff. God knows the heart. He knows what's going on in your world. He knows your motive. He knows the deep desires. You can pray nicely of this, but God reads this bit in here. He knows the heart. He knows what your real desires are. He knows the motives of your heart. When we walk in holiness, there is nothing covered up that will not be uncovered. God wants us to get real with him. You've got to be transparent with God. And Gehazi tried to cover it up. He said, oh, I wasn't anywhere. And he said, you took payment. Not understanding that God was trying to do a big picture here of resolve conflict between Syria and Israel. But because Gehazi took payment from Naaman and the Syrian, he thought it was all good, all covered, and there was no obligation back towards Israel. Sometimes we don't see the big picture and we just look at the local things. God was trying to do a big picture here and resolve conflict between the two nations. So Elisha said, okay, Gehazi, the same leprosy that had the Syrian, you've got it now. And he went out covered in leprosy white. Apparently it makes you white. I don't know if he was black before, but he was white after. Are you seeing this? You, when we walk with God, if we're going to receive what God wants, we've got to have the right heart. The next servant came along to Elisha. He was serving him. And the Syrians had surrounded the place with an army, with chariots, with horses. This conflict had not been resolved by the way God had wanted to resolve it. And the Syrians had surrounded Israel. And the servant said to Elisha, what are we going to do? Looking naturally. We sang this song before, open the eyes of my heart. <laughs> Second Kings chapter 6, verse 20. We got that, John? Elisha said, Lord, Open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw and they were there inside Samaria.
Verse 17, can you go back to that one? Elijah prayed to his servant, said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. <clears throat> and he was asking this young man, did he have discernment? Did he see what God is doing? There might have been surrounded by natural problems, natural enemy attacking him. But he said, Lord, open his eyes that he might see the answer of heaven. And the place was full of the angels of God, the chariots and fire of God. The place was full of authority from heaven. We've got to get the third heaven answers to be able to deal with the second heaven problems that outwork in the first heaven. We've got to get the answers from God to how to deal with spiritual stuff. That's why we've got to press in, be people of prayer, be people who hear the voice of heaven, be people who hear God, know how to walk with God, know how to hear what God is saying, know how to pray it through and see the answers of God break forth. How many of you want a double portion? Well, here's the truth. The truth is that we are in Christ. And he was anointed without measure. He has all authority in heaven and earth. Christ has already given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. We are already in him. Why are we asking for a double portion of what's in the Old Testament? Because we've already got more in the New. I'm quiet in here. We have the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. We have the same Holy Spirit is in us. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead will quicken your mortal bodies. We have not because we ask not. Ask him to heal you of your midgy allergies. Ask him. Walk with God. Allow the power and life of the spirit of God to flow through you with power and life. Let the life of the spirit flow through you. God has put us in it already. We have all things. We have authority. We have because we're in Christ. We are in him and he is in us. We are one with him. We have it already, friends. We don't need a double portion. We already have. We need to just believe what God has already given us. Hello? We already have the, the walk with Christ who owns all things and upholds all things by the word of his power. We already have a oneness with Christ, who through him all the worlds were created. We already have a oneness with Christ, who is the head over all things and below him. Let's read Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18 to 23. Let's go back to Ephesians. It says some amazing things in Ephesians. It describes life in the Spirit so incredibly powerfully. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. And the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of all in all. That is a big scripture. It says so much. We have already been given this place. He is the head over all things. Get this, not only in this age, but in the age to come. He's already authority in our future. He's already authority in the next era. He is already the head over this next season. He's already the head over whatever happens on the earth. He is already the head and we are his body. How do we know whether we're walking in the life of this, whether we've got the right mindset or not? How do we know this? Let me, let me uh, 
show you a few things. If we're just naturally minded, you'll worry a lot. You'll think about things and worry. If you're naturally minded, you'll feel like a powerless victim. You have a big devil and a little God. If you have a natural mind about things, you don't think you have anything to contribute. And your self-image will, will be so low because you, you think you're not good enough. If you're just naturally minded, you're convinced that every year the world is getting worse. Quiet. If you're naturally minded, all your prayers are reactions to bad circumstances. If you're naturally minded, you'll have no vision for the future. If you're naturally minded, you'll struggle with low self-esteem and a poverty mentality. I find when I get into the presence of God and I'm praying about my circumstances, they all just seem to fall away and suddenly I'm looking at the bigger picture again. If you're spiritually minded, you'll believe God can do the impossible and think like he does, that all things are possible, that there's nothing too difficult because God is bigger than every circumstance and every situation. If you're spiritually minded, you'll live with a vision to leave a legacy to your children's children, that you'll have a purpose. If you're, not, if you're spiritually minded, the world's troubles only challenge you to think bigger and bring God's ideas to the table. If you're spiritually minded, you'll view devil encounters as a compliment and opportunities to overcome. I've had a few of them. If you're spiritually minded, you'll know that you're a son or daughter of the king and you'll behave like royalty. You'll treat people with respect and honour because you're royalty. If you're spiritually minded, the commission to disciple nations forms your prayer life. And you're about the great commission to change our world and not just being reactive to local circumstances. If you're spiritually minded, you'll look for God's perspective on current events and refuse to let media or religious spirits affect your worldview. To be spiritually minded, friends, is to put aside every small thought, everything that says it's too difficult, it's too hard, there's a bigger problem, there's no answers. To be spiritually minded walks with a God who has all the answers and knows all things and is well able to overcome. To be spiritually minded, friends, if we're going to walk with God in this new season, we've got to lift out of every negative and out of everything that keeps and holds us down and speaks to us. If you're like me, sometimes you drop down there and things speak and, and the accuser of the brethren can come along and stick his little needle into your thinking and make you go down and end up in depression. But if you are spiritually minded, friends, you'll take a hold of those lies, put them under your feet, say, I have authority over that. I'm not going to allow that to continue through my life, through my thoughts, through who I am, and walk in the authority that God has given you and step up and step in and take a, the authority in the name of Jesus, put a smile on your face, go to sleep with a coat hanger in your mouth, do whatever it takes, but you'll win. Hello? <laughs> Hello? There's some winners. You're winners. You're winners. You're winners. Winners are grinners. But I tell you what, sometimes it takes a bit of work on this old self man. It takes a bit of putting it to the cross. It's got to die. And dying can be unpleasant and painful. But when it's dead, there comes resurrection. And the resurrection live with the Spirit can lift you up and you walk in victory and overcoming power as we walk with God and allow the life of the Spirit to flow through us and let us lift us up into this dimension of the Spirit, this place that we walk with God, who is well able to, to lift us up out of every situation. The trials of the righteous are many, but, 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 but God delivers us from them all. God is well able to deliver us. He's well able to lift you out of every circumstance and situation. He's well able, friends, as we walk with him, put aside every thought that disagrees with what God says because it is a lie, not the truth. Put aside everything that says my circumstances are too difficult because that is not the truth. The truth is God is well able. He is my God. He's a wonderful God. Friends, walk with him. Let the relationship of God 
Let that relationship be the thing that empowers you. Don't just go to God. Don't just go to God looking for more power. Go to God as the lover of your soul. I've got a friend who has done an incredible healing ministry. I've talked about him before. These astonishing miracles. But he's had an incredible journey to deal with unbelief. Had a tumour the size of a football in his stomach. Walked this whole journey, but yet he chose to believe God. Now he sees tumours instantly disappear off people's bodies. Chose to walk with God, chose to put aside every negative that would come and speak to him. Chose to, to allow the goodness of God to permeate his thinking. Well, chose to allow who God is. And he did it just by spending time with God. I watched him. I've had him in my home. He would just spend time just being in the presence of God and allowing the relationship to empower him. Not just trying to look to overcome, but the relationship. It's about that relationship. It's about the relationship. Like it's, it's about knowing him and allowing God to carry you allowing God to walk with you, putting aside every negative so that you can stay in his presence, putting aside every, every thought of, of unforgiveness because you can't take that into his presence, putting aside all those things and just walking in his presence and abiding in him. Abide, abide, abide in his presence. Let's just pray. Father, I thank you for your word today. I thank you that you help us to be people of the Spirit, understanding how this thing works and walking with you as a God who is a Spirit and, and you've made us people of the Spirit. You've made us a church that are called to pray and to press in and get the answers of heaven. You've made us as a people, Lord, who will know what you're doing and walk with you. And Father, we honour you and thank you in Jesus' name. We honour you and thank you and thank you and thank you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.